Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of our conference. My name is Mohammad Ali Taha. I'm a member of Kurdistan Parliament, Iraq. It gives me a great pleasure to be with you for the first panel of the last day of conference. Well, our panel is very interesting, as you can see in the title. <laughs> ISIL and Al-Qaeda in the Arab world. Our first panelist is Mona Alami. She is a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council Rafik Hariri Center for Middle East. Uh, she's also a PhD student. She's pursuing her PhD on non-state armed actors in the Syrian war. We will give her the first chance to speak and then she will leave because she said she has a flight to go to Baghdad. I insisted her not to go, but she <laughs> insisted. <laughs> Mona Alami, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, uh, first of all, I'm covering uh, Lebanon and Jordan. I'm not going to be covering uh, Palestine because it's not my expertise. However, I will broach on uh, the issue of Palestinian camps in Lebanon. I'm going to start with, um, with uh, Lebanon. And as you see, I have a similar structure for both sections. To start with Lebanon, uh, Lebanon has, uh, the jihadist scene in Lebanon has been closely interlinked with Palestinian camp in the 1990s, which witnessed the emergence of uh, groups such as Azbat al-Ansar, Azbat al-Nur, and Jindal sham Azbat al-Ansar has been, uh, a lot of fighters from Azbat al-Ansar went to fight in Iraq, and, um, and uh, they were behind several terrorist organizations in Saida particularly. The 19, 2007, um, uh, the 19 2007, uh, uh, year witnessed an inflection point for the jihadist scene in Lebanon because we witnessed the clashes between a group called Fath al-Islam and the Lebanese army that lasted for three months. Fath al-Islam was a group that was headed by Sheikh al-Absi who had strong ties with Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. When, with the onset of the, of the 2011 uh, war in Syria, uh, this war divided Lebanon, which was already uh, separated by very strong fault lines between Sunni and Shiites. And this feeling was only exacerbate, exacerbated uh, by the Syrian war, with Sunnis siding with the opposition, with the rebellion, while, uh, whereas uh, Hezbollah uh, sided with uh, the Alawite regime of Bashar al-Assad. So in, in starting 2003, we've seen uh, the repercussions of the war in Syria. Um, and we, we've seen the repercussions of the war in Syria with several terrorist attacks. In 2013, there were two terrorist attacks. In 2014, 15 terrorist attacks. Uh, in, in 2015, six. And 2016, four. What were the hotspots, uh, extremist hotspots in Lebanon? Um, you see them uh, on this map uh, where actually there was a lot of extremist activity. I'll start with Tripoli and North Lebanon. In Tripoli and North Lebanon, uh, we witnessed over 20 uh, clashes between the Lebanese armed forces on one side and um, fighters uh, who were aligned either with Jabhat al-Nusra or with the Islamic State. Saida, uh, south of Lebanon was, an, was another extremist hotspot. In 2013, we also saw deadly clashes between, that lasted for three days between the Lebanese army and uh, a movement uh, led by Sheikh Asir. Sheikh Ahmed al Asir was a strong opponent to Hezbollah and a supporter of, um, of uh, the Syrian rebellion. Uh, the Lebanese armed forces told me he had also links with Jabhat al Nusra. And he only, not only gathered Lebanese behind him, but as well. Well, a Palestinian from the Ain al-Halwa Palestinian camp. The Bika, um, the Bika Valley uh, had two hotspots, Majd al-Anjar and Arsal. You've probably heard about Arsal, maybe uh, of Majd al-Anjar to a lesser extent. I'm talking about uh, Majd al-Anjar because it has a very interesting history. A lot of fighters uh, in the 2003 phase went from Majd al-Anjar to fight in Iraq. So a younger generation of people were also involved in jihadists in the post-2011 war. And if there were a few clashes in that town with the Lebanese armed forces. Aysal was definitely one of the most active 
hotspots, jihadist hotspot, because it was used as a conduit until 2017 by Jabhat al-Nusra and by ISIS to smuggle weapons and booby-trapped cars. However, in 2017, there was a combined uh, operation by Hezbollah and by the Lebanese armed forces that cracked down on these jihadist groups and forced them um, and made an agreement with them so that they would be uh, moved uh, elsewhere in Syria. Ain al Hilu is my last example. When I spoke about Aspet al Ansar, this is where Ain al Hilu is the hometown of Aspet al Ansar. So in, in al Hilu, you have a younger, an older jihadist generation that is now much more pragmatic, that collaborate with the government. For example, when there were recent clashes with the younger generation of jihadists, and you have a younger generation of jihadists. Uh, some of them are with Jund al-Sham, other with Fath al-Islam, and other belong to something called uh, Shabab Muslim, and they're headed by a man called Bilal Badr, who is believed to have left. Uh, we don't know his whereabouts. And uh, what was interesting is Ain al-Hilwe is that we saw some fighters go, for example, in Qusair, train rebels in Qusair on uh, the use of IEDs, for example. And we also saw um, less than 100 uh, fighters around 100 fighters go for jihad in Syria. So that was particularly interesting. Um, in Lebanon, I, I forgot to tell you that uh, less than 1,000 fighters went to fight uh, for jihad in, uh, in, uh, in Syria. So Ain al-Hilwi was a very uh, uh, instrumental uh, center, if you want, for jihadism. Uh, according to sources in the security services who told me, uh, a lot of the operations were planned uh, starting from Ain al-Hilwi. Uh, what another interesting point is that in Ain al Hilwe, for example, all of these groups had members who were either pledging allowance, uh, allegiance to Jabhat al Nusra and other to ISIS, although they were in the same group. So there was an am amalgam of allegiances, which is quite unusual compared to other countries. Uh, what can we conclude in terms of trans, um, sorry, uh, in, tr in terms of trans of uh, jihad in Lebanon? First of all, uh, we, we saw that in the attacks, the more recent attacks in 2015 and 2016 were all headed uh, or orchestrated by ISIS. The more recent attacks, the earlier attacks were either orchestrated by unknown groups after by Abdullah Azam and after by Jabhat al-Nusra with an allegiance between Jabhat al-Nusra and Abdullah Azam. Interestingly, what this is a point I mentioned in al uh, we also that we also witnessed in Tripoli when there were clashes with the Lebanese armed forces also in Tripoli, we saw people from Jabhat al-Nusra and from ISIS fighting together against the Lebanese armed forces. So basically the rivalry that w w between Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS did not reflect on the Lebanese arena, according to uh, sources in the Mukhabarat, the Lebanese Mukhabarat. When we look at the profile of the jihadists, I met a few jihadists who went to fight in Syria, and what I noticed that uh, I, saw, I saw common denominators between them. First of all, many of them were very influenced um, by the political events in Lebanon. Um, more particularly, uh, uh, they were influenced by the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Rafi al-Hariri, which uh, is attributed allegedly to um, uh, five um, militants from Hezbollah. So they were very affected by that. Many of them lived uh, in fault lines, in areas where there was a strong rivalry between either Alawites and Sunni or Shiites and Sunni. I'm talking about Tripoli, I'm talking about Saida and South Lebanon. Uh, and many of them had lived in areas that were also had proximity or family ties with Syrian family in the opposition or in rebel groups in rebel groups. Some of them had also the Iraqi narrative, jihadist narratives, in, uh, were exposed to the jihadi narratives. I'm talking about specifically about people from Majd al-Anjar, people from Tripoli, and people from Ain al-Hilwe. So they had this jihadist narrative from older generation. Uh, all of them were living in areas that were neglected by the state and where poverty levels were extremely high and where you had low education levels. Uh, finally, one of the final um, points, a trend that we witnessed according that I think uh, Lebanese services have witnessed is that the movement, like the trend in jihad has changed to a leaderless jihad. So we saw operations starting with organized and structured operation, moving to small decentralized cell maybe two years ago, and now now maybe lone wolf operation with people working on an individual level or with two other three people. So this is, these are the trends we can conclude from Lebanon. To move on to Jordan, uh, Jordan um, has 
tackled uh, jihadism uh, since uh, the 80s, when you saw Jordanian uh, being drawn into the international co coalition of foreign jihad, starting with Afghanistan with the Abdullah Azam al-Qaeda's ideologue, and moving into Iraq with Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. <coughs> the, Syri uh, the Syrian example is quite interesting because um, um, actually, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda's offshoot in Syria, was dominated by Jordanian. I'm talking about Abu Julaybib, Dr. Sami al aridi <coughs> Excuse me. And more recently, what's actually interesting, I don't know if you're, most of you must be aware, there was a rift between Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, the former Jabhat al-Nusra, and the people hardliners uh, who didn't, who were, who were against, uh, you know, separating from al-Qaeda. And the hardliners have joined, uh, have created a group called uh, Harras al din which, uh, which is a coalition of several groups such as Jaysh al-Badia, Jaysh al-Malahim, Jaysh al-Sahil, and many other groups, even uh, people from Jund al-Aqsa. And this group is also dominated, it has a lot of Jordanian figures uh, that are leading uh, the group. So uh, these several phases of jihad translated in uh, attacks. In 2016, in March, there was an extended battle between uh, Jordanian forces in Erbid against uh, jihadists. In June 2016, five Jordanian intelligence officers were shot at the Baqa camp. Uh, I think that the Baqa camp is significant because uh, most of you don't know that, but it's a hometown, hometown of someone called Abu Muhammad uh, Tahawi. Abu Muhammad Tahawi is a man I met, and he's one of the um, first men who called jihadists who called for jihad in Syria. I think he's in prison right now. Also in June 2016, six Jordanian soldiers were killed in the, uh, and wounded after a car bomb in uh, the camp of Rukban, which was also claimed by ISIS. On December 2016, uh, most of you know there were clashes in the Karak, um, uh, in Karak between, uh, between uh, people from ISIS as well as Jordanian uh, police. And in January 2017, uh, Jordan said, uh, announced it had dismantled a cell of 17 people that was affiliated to ISIS. Uh, what are the Jordanian hotspots? So um, most uh, Jordanian activ um, jihadist activity is uh, in Zarqa, Erbit, Salt, and Ma'an. Uh, I'd like to just to point to a study that I found uh, extremely um, interesting. It was conducted in 2016 by Anne Speckert, and she went around some cities such as Erbid as well as Zarqa to see, uh, to actually uh, try evaluating um, uh, uh, the you know, youth, uh, youth impressions of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And according to the study, 4.5% of Zarqa youth stated that ISIS was close to their personal beliefs, whereas 2.7% said Al-Qaeda represented their beliefs. So when we put that together, it's over 7.3, which is a significant number for a city like Zalqa. In Erbit, this figure dropped to 1.5% for ISIS and 1.5% for Al-Qaeda. But I still think these figures are quite high. What trends can we conclude in Jordan? OK, first of all, um, according to interviews I've conducted with uh, jihadists such as Abu Sayyaf, uh, Abu Muhammad al tahawi before he went to prison, and as well as jihadist experts, experts such as Hassan Buhaniya, we see that um, more and more Transjordanians are attracted to, uh, the, uh, are, to the appeal of jihad. Uh, and they say that before it was more people from Palestinian descent. So that's the first trend. The second trend is definitely a generational gap. I think that's also something common to other countries, with younger people supporting ISIS and the older generation supporting Al-Qaeda. According to Hassan Abu Haniya, about 80% of jihadists in Jordan, and we're talking a population of 10,000 jihadists, support ISIS. I think it's a, quite a big number. Uh, th the third point is that the background of contemporary jihadists also is changing. According to Hassan Abu Haniya, more and more lower middle class people are embracing jihad. And he thinks, uh, he believes, he conducted a study, and he believes that this is due to the change of status resulting from uh, the change in economic situation in Jordan with worsening economic factors. The last trend is that um, more recently, the cells that were dismantled were not connected to one another, so they were uh, working in isolation from one another, experts told me. Um, initially, when I started this, um, this, um, this presentation... You have to finish it also. Yeah, I'm, I'm nearly done. It's not 15 minutes.
Yeah, it is. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, can we talk about the end of jihad in these two countries? I really think in most Lebanon and in Jordan, um, there's been a significant intelligence work against in the jihadist cell, and it's been very uh, efficient. Um, returnees have been banned from coming back uh, to, to Lebanon and to Jordan. We're talking about over 100 returnees in Lebanon. Over 300 were arrested in Jordan. Uh, in addition, I think that the defeats of ISIS and Al-Qaeda um, have have also contributed to uh, the disillusion of uh, younger jihadists. However, these countries, despite the fact that these countries have really cracked down on um, on the jihadist threat, I think there are risk factors that in, are inherent to both countries and more specifically to Jordan. Um, I think that uh, I believe that uh, the, the, there is still in both countries a disaffected youth. A feeling of political powerlessness, and that's even more accentuated in Jordan, uh, worsening economic factors, lack of opportunity of in, in employment, and the possibility to, rea to realize oneself. Um, these are in Lebanon. These factors are definitely more acute within the Syrian and Palestinian refugee populations. Uh, but more importantly, in Jordan, you have drivers that are the most essential drivers that are present, which is community support and exposure to the jihadist narrative that are quite prevalent in Jordan. So I think that these countries still have very significant risk factors in terms of the jihadist threat. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I had to, <laughs> to be so fast. Thank you, Mona. Uh, we will. Uh, if you have any questions, the audience, because Mona would like to leave at 10. Yes, Reuter, please. Okay, uh, until uh, the mic comes, I, I have a small question. Uh, they need it. They need it. Uh, you uh, talked about numbers and statistics, uh, of course, uh, about the uh, Yemenis and Syrians and all these people that uh, are no, recruited. Yeah. You, you Syrians and, and, and Lebanese. Uh, what strategies did, uh, and, uh, did ISIL and Al Qaeda use uh, for recruitment, for example? Okay, so uh, there, there are different strategies. Uh, when we look at Lebanon, for example, there are two, two types of uh, you know recruitment. It's offline and online. So basically, as I said, you have people, for example, in Lebanon who are exposed to jihadist narrative in areas such as in Tripoli, such as the Mancubin, uh, such as uh, there are several areas in uh, Tripoli. So within their family, they have these narrative that is prevalent, and um, they have also family ties with rebel people. For example, in Tripoli, there was a Junda Sham was operating in Qala'at al husn in Syria. And uh, because they had family ties with the people from Mancubin, they were able to recruit over, I think, 300 people from uh, Mancubin alone. Uh, so that was one offline strategy uh, for Junda Sham. Um, however, there you have also with ISIS offline. We've noticed that more recently with the crackdown on jihadist group, uh, there were links, for example, between younger jihadists uh, who were speaking on Telegram uh, with the people in, in Raqqa, before Raqqa fell, or in Mosul, more specifically in Raqqa, and who were indoctrinated in this way. So there was both ways, offline and online recruitment. For the uh, Jordanian aspect, I remember when Daesh killed the Jordanian pilot yeah. and in a way fooled or tricked the Jordanian government that they should uh, exchange one of the long-term uh, Qaeda prisoners while they already had killed the guy. Sure. Um, I remember it had quite a deep impact at least on the, let's say, community support, the gray zone which hadn't really any objections mm. against ISIS, mm. but this changed afterwards. Correct. Um, how was the long-lasting effect of this? Uh, look, from my understanding, from the figures I saw, definitely when um, uh, Qasasbi, I think, uh, was killed, uh, there was a really strong uh, opposition within Jordan. But you have to think that for hardliner jihadists, a lot of them said that uh, Qasasbi was fighting with the coalition against Daesh, and he was fighting Arabs with uh, the Westerners. So for hardliner jihadists, this does not change their opinion. There was a small regression in numbers, but as you see, for example, from the study of, of Anne Speckard, which was in 2016, which was after, I think, the Qasasbi killing, the numbers are still high. 
So I think that was, uh, you know, the, the impact was more maybe for non, not hardliner jihadists, but for really core jihadists, I don't think the impact was that significant. Thank you. Gentlemen in the back. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Muna, um, just my question is, uh, you mentioned a lot. I'm not yet a doctor. <laughs> uh, you will, inshallah, in the future. Um, my question is, we are focusing in my organization on post-ISIS uh, strategy, especially focusing on the youth, because as you mentioned, the youth uh, has a, a huge role in, uh, in ISIS um, organizations. I want to hear your perspective on preventions on the future, how we prevent youth to be uh, re recruited again, as you know, ISIS is an ideology, so it might last for, for a bit of, of, of time. I want to hear your perspective on the preventions, on protecting youth from ISIS crimes or oh, in future. I don't think there is one approach because the, when you look at the profile of jihadists, there are so many motivations for people. Uh, yesterday, I think someone was speaking about people being motivated by having a better life because they wanted to join, uh, you know, a pure ca Islamic caliphate because uh, they wanted for financial reasons because they wanted to avenge maybe uh, someone in their family had killed uh, by the police so there are so many different or, or because they felt marginalized there are so many different um, feelings but I think that one feeling that is common to all jihadists is there is the feeling of powerlessness and shame and, uh, uh, and injustice and I think these are extremely powerful actually injustice and shame are the most powerful feelings in a human being so I think that when you want to go to in a community you need to try understanding these to tackle if you want to develop a program so if there's a feeling for example of injustice within a community you need to understand why is the, f f is the community, community feeling marginalized is it because they don't have access to, uh, to work or job or an evolution in personal life like others that's maybe one way. But secondly, I think a very important job that one has to do like firsthand when you go into such a community is uh, you have to uh, also look at people around the person who went for jihad. Because as we said, the, the generally these jihadists have a supportive community. So you need to identify these people and try to de-radicalize them, <coughs> expose them to another form of interpretation of um, Islam, but not just bringing by a sheikh who's like 89 years old and going to read them verses of, the, verses of the Quran, but someone who can speak their language. ISIS is good because it empowers people and it speaks the language of the youth. And we need to tailor sheikhs who can speak the same language and give other options and de-radicalize them in the same way. But also you have to give them something to do, not just uh, talk to them. You have to find them uh, trainings, jobs, uh, make them feel they can be empowered by other means. I think that's a very important. And I think that one thing that hasn't been done in the Arab world is that we have a lot of idols for the youth, footballers, uh, maybe maybe people who sing Quran uh, in a way, uh, people who um, who are well known within the youth and respected with a certain youth. Why don't we use, an, use them as brand, not like for example company use them as brand, uh, so do you know, use brand supporters? We use to use them and to voice the message that is anti-ISIS. And that's not something that has been done. Throwing them in prison and giving them very classical religious uh, uh, classes is not enough. Do you think, sorry, sorry, do you think uh, the sense of belonging is one of the issues? Yeah, definitely a sense of belonging because people are marginalized. For example, I was in Brussels when you talk to uh, Belgian people who are originally Moroccan. They feel that they're rejected by their community. They feel that they don't have the same access. If your name is Abdel Karim Haj and that you're applying to a job in Belgium, you have more chances of being rejected than if your name is Francois Pierrot. So there is a feeling of rejection. So. Uh, sorry, it's 10 o'clock. <laughs> Uh, one last question and... I have to go. Very shortly. Thank you, Madam Mona. I just have a small question. You are talking a lot about poverty, about uh, social problems, but I haven't heard any word about the Wahhabism, ah, which is the Wahhabism. Definitely. Which is the source, if you want, the origin of all our problems 
in uh, this uh, 20th and 21st century. You are right. Thank For example, you. Jordan uh, had a big problem with its mosque because uh, it has, I think, over 7,000 mosques. And uh, more than half these mosques are ha headed by sheikhs that are not uh, controlled by the, by the government. And they're trying to, um, you know, they're trying to curb on that. Yeah, definitely, I think there should be more control on what uh, sheikhs uh, who have extreme views are saying in the mosques. Uh, and especially in mosques that are maybe sometimes they are informal mosques. I think, yes, the, the state has a job to do when it comes to controlling the speech, the hate speech of Salafi or Wahhabi uh, extremist uh, sheikhs. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have to go. I'm really Excellent sorry. Excellent presentation. <laughs> have a safe flight. Okay. Our second presentation is uh, on Al-Qaeda dominance in the Arabian Peninsula. Dr. Elizabeth Kandal is with us for the second presentation. Uh, she is a senior research fellow in Arabic and Islamic studies at Prombok College, Oxford University. We had a very nice conversation last night and this is very interesting <laughs> what she's doing nowadays. She is researching ISIS and Al-Qaeda inside poetry. Can you believe that? The floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you for that very generous introduction. It's my pleasure to, to be here. Um, I'm going to look very briefly at the recent resurgence of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Of course, the group came together in 2009 formally when the Saudi and Yemeni branches united. But I have published on this recent resurgence, and so I'll move quite quickly on to what's happening today and what might happen next. Um, so if you want to go into more depth in any of the first half of my short presentation, you can find my work on my academia.edu site. I don't recommend that you buy any of my incredibly overpriced books. It's all up there for free. So if you look at this map, the shaded area in stripes represents the area that Al-Qaeda had influence over or control over from 2015 onwards. This is a vast area and it's incredibly interesting to see how they did that. You see, of course, the resurgence of Al-Qaeda in 2015 coincided exactly with the beginning of the Saudi-led military coalition intervention in Yemen. The fragmentation of the state, the destabilization of Yemen gave the ideal opportunity for Al-Qaeda to move into that space and to frame the current war in Yemen in terms of its own sectarian narrative. But there's a lot more going on than just that. We always ask the question, what is it that radicalizes people? What is it that causes them to join the jihad? In Yemen, the question is a different one. The question that we should be asking is what leads populations to tolerate the presence of Al-Qaeda, to get along with it? Because it's not the case that everyone joined the Mujahideen in this shaded area. Even at its peak, Al-Qaeda in Yemen was only about 4,000 fighters. And this is a population in Yemen that is well armed. There are loads of weapons. They're used to fighting and they're used to death. So they can't be terrorized into submission very easily. There have to be other mechanisms going on. I thought a good place to start to look for why Al-Qaeda has managed to succeed in gaining this toleration of communities would be to go and ask myself. So I undertook a survey in the east of Yemen of 2,000, just over 2,000 tribesmen and women in the east of Yemen. Uh, and just a couple of the results very quickly, I discovered that only 21% believed that religious leaders should advise on all matters. So hardly any. And only 10% want a single strong leader. So these are precisely the kinds of populations that embraced, or not embraced, but tolerated Al-Qaeda 
from 2015 onwards. And yet, clearly, there was no appetite for a caliphate. Um, how did it happen? Well, here, you can just about make out um, photos of what was essentially, I mean, you could call it an Al-Qaeda rock concert that it put on in the east of Yemen in 2016. This is an example of what Al-Qaeda was doing in the east of Yemen while bombs were raining down on the west of Yemen. We actually saw Yemenis moving to the Al-Qaeda-controlled areas because they, they seemed like a haven of stability in comparison to what was happening in the west of the country. This particular event, and uh, I was nearby at the time, um, went on for three days. It was the Jerusalem We're Coming Festival, and it featured these guys uh, in the top corner. You can see Al-Qaeda fighters performing their combat moves to flashing lights in front of the crowds. Uh, and there were nasheeds playing. Of course, there was no instrumental music, but it really had a rock concert feel. And at wowing the crowds and the kids, um, this seemed like a paradise by comparison with what was happening elsewhere. I also discovered that Al-Qaeda was undertaking a raft of community projects. So here we have pictures of Al-Qaeda hooking up power stations, air conditioners for hospitals, building roads, and fixing schools. This is, this is a girls' school, in fact. And when I actually analyzed Al-Qaeda's Twitter feed, its governance Twitter feed, 56% of all tweets were about community development projects. Only 3% were about the hudud punishments of Islamic law. And yet, it's that 3% that always gets picked up by think tanks and intelligence organizations and then the international media until we have the impression that all they're doing is chopping off people's hands and stoning people for adultery. And of course, that matters because it means our reaction and how we deal with it and how we counter those narratives is skewed. It's wrong. We should be doing this kind of thing. This is what wins communities over. They also had excellent branding, something they'd learnt. Someone yesterday said Al-Qaeda is a learning organization. It certainly is in Yemen. Sacks of flour, and that's emblazoned with, you know, a you know, gift from your brothers. Uh, and then a bus for the municipality, the, the water and sewage municipality. And then in the bottom corner, you see first aid kits, 500 of them that were put in schools. Uh, and that's emblazoned with their very local branding, the Sons of Hadramaut. Abna Hadramaut. Those are still around in schools. There was a youth campaign as well. So on the left, you can see a group of schoolboys. This was a part of a, of a competition around um, the city of Mukalla and its environs, which was to see who could design the best anti-American poster, the best anti-drone poster. And here you can see a big splodge of blood with the words al Amriki, kulluna didhu, you know, all against Americans. And then in the top corner, kids singing. I mean, it was fun. And the prizes for these competitions were Kalashnikovs, AK-47s, motorbikes, you know, interesting stuff. And um, there was even actually a blindfolded ice cream eating competition for the kids. You know, Al-Qaeda is not all about chopping people's heads off or hands off. Uh, and then finally, they communicate in a way that resonates locally. I'm not going to go into this. This is my speciality. I love talking about poetry, but we haven't got time today. Just note that one in every five pages, so 20% of Al-Qaeda's main magazine, uh, contains poetry. So it's not there for fun. It, has a, it plays a, a real role. Now, from 2017 onwards, things have not looked so rosy for Al-Qaeda. It's facing difficulties. It was not defeated when special forces pushed it out of its capital in April 2016. It simply melted away, it withdrew, it moved. The reports in the Gulf press of 800 dead, etc., are simply not true. But it is now suffering. From 2017 onwards, the UAE recruited militias across the south of Yemen have been fairly effective. And we know this because Al-Qaeda's, well, we know this for three reasons. Number one, Al-Qaeda's statements 
formal statements have started to turn on tribesmen, so to criticize tribesmen who are joining up with the UAE militias. Uh, previously, they were simply criticizing the UAE. Now they're criticizing locals who are signing up. And so what one can imagine is that there is a, a, a group of what I call uniform swappers who have left Al-Qaeda and joined the militias. We also know this because of the targeting. I've logged every single Al-Qaeda attack during 2017. And I noticed that during the first six months, this is your graph on the left, 75% of Al-Qaeda attacks were directed against the Houthis, the Houthi rebels in Yemen's north who've taken over the capital and who Al-Qaeda and some others considered to be arch Shiites. In the second half of 2017, that has started to switch. Most attacks are now against the United Arab Emirates military security forces, against their militias. So that's telling. And the third piece of evidence is that on the telegram groups in which I sit, not as myself, as somebody else, um, it's very clear that there's a steady stream of martyrs from the lament poetry that's coming out, from the photos, the martyrologies. They're, they're suffering, they're dying. The United Arab Emirates is, is now being referred to in very derogatory terms, either as, you know, Duwaylet uh, al-Khadarat, Duwaylet al-Khamarat, you know, the little state, the statelet of filth, the statelet of wine. Uh, it, it's, it's starting to absorb more of the anger than the Houthis. So this is a really interesting switch. But there is some evidence also that al-Qaeda is simply moving around a little. The coalition keeps claiming defeats in different areas, and yet the number of martyrologies does not correspond to the numbers anywhere close to the numbers that the coalition is saying that it's killing. And we are seeing al-Qaeda simply crop up in different areas. So its operations tend to just move around. Uh, recently, there was the UAE-led Operation Al-Faisal in February in Hadramaut. It lasted about five days. United Arab Emirates coalition reports were saying that it lasted about one and a half days. Um, Al-Qaeda claimed that it killed about 40 soldiers. Emirates says, you know, it lost a couple, maybe. It's very difficult to know where the truth lies. What we do know is that Al-Qaeda has said, at the end of the five days, we withdrew and we're now in a nearby place. Some of the evidence from Telegram points to that being the case. Um, now, in 2018 especially, so the last three months, things are really looking quite bleak for Al-Qaeda. We had... Uh, Sorry, I shouldn't really be showing you this slide yet. Don't look at the picture. Um, we had 273 Al-Qaeda attacks during 2017. So far this year, we've had 31. So if the same rate of attack continues, we will end up with half the number of Al-Qaeda attacks this year as last year. Islamic State, on the other hand, which has never held territory in Yemen, it never undertook community works. It certainly didn't use culturally resonant forms like poetry to communicate. It was considered alien. Islamic State has, to date this year, conducted 13 attacks. Last year, it only conducted between 25 and 30, so 10 times fewer than Al-Qaeda. But if the rate continues as it is this year, it will, it will have doubled its number of attacks on last year. So to summarize, what I'm saying is that Al-Qaeda seems to be declining a little, and Islamic State seems to be rising. Not massively, and it will never take off like Al-Qaeda did for a whole bunch of reasons, which I can't go into. But I think what's happening is that we're seeing the foot soldiers start to be more fluid between the groups. And part of the reason for this is that, number one, so many al-Qaeda have been droned. 
Number two, the main leaders of al-Qaeda, people like Qasim Aremi and Khaled Batarfi, have gone to ground. They're lying low. They're in hiding. And their communications have been disrupted. We saw them fall off their telegram wires for three weeks. It's unheard of. Uh, during February and March this year. Nothing happened. There was nothing posted. And we also saw um, a whole series of pre-recorded posts. I have had the dubious pleasure of watching essentially the box set of Qasim Araimi's uh, 40 lectures on Al-Harthami's medieval war treatise. Which, he, which have been coming out, almost saved for a rainy day. When we're not doing operations, let's put up one of our leaders' war treatise lectures. They're incredibly boring. And they just go on and on, and they've clearly been filmed in one single session, although they claim, they don't, they claim that's not the case. It's very clear that they have been. And whenever nothing's happening, they post one. Um, but what's interesting, there is one interesting thing about these medieval war treatise lectures, and that is that it seems to be trying to justify using Harthami as a source, the fact that Al-Qaeda is in retreat, the fact that they're withdrawing, that they're not standing and fighting. Uh, all right, I have about one minute left. Less than. I have 30 <laughs> seconds left. Okay. Um, we also know that there's been a lot of infighting inside the groups. So previously, the groups criticized each other. Islamic State criticized Al-Qaeda for not implementing Sharia. Al-Qaeda criticized Islamic State for being lazy. Their fighters don't get up before lunchtime. And even when they do go to the front, they're more interested in taking photos, photo shoots, than they are in fighting Houthis. Or... There's been a lot of backbiting inside the Telegram groups. now. They're not criticizing each other, but they're criticizing themselves. So I think this shows a, an increasing fragmentation in the movement, like Guido mentioned yesterday, but also the fact that they're sort of moving between the groups a little more. Uh, I'm happy to go into that in more detail. I have plenty more examples of why I think that's the case. Uh, I just want to leave you, sorry, I, I haven't really gone through these properly, but this final slide. Don't think that they're not still focused on the West. This came, of course, the last Inspire magazine was in August, and it was focused on train derailment in the West. This came out in December and was still doing the rounds in January. It's Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula desperately trying to claim some credit for the train derailment in Washington, DC. This never seemed to hit the media at all, but I found it very interesting. And of course, it also shows Anwar al-Awlaqi you can drone these guys, but they live on. Um, they ne you, you can't really get rid of them. They, they live on beyond the grave, and they're constantly in the propaganda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kendall. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Hans Jacob Schindler. We just can't get enough of his knowledge about <laughs> this subject. Yesterday, we had him for the second panel. And he agreed to be in this panel with us. Originally, uh, Mr. Mohammed Al Jarrah from Libya was with us, was supposed to be with us for this panel, but for technical reasons, he couldn't make it to, the per to, to this conference. Dr. Hans Jacob Schindler, thank you very much for accepting to be with us on this panel. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak again. Uh, and obviously, it's a great honor to be in such an august panel, and I hope I'm not going to disappoint too much. Um, what I um, will look at mainly in this presentation is the situation in Libya, but what you need to know is that the team that I used to lead in the Security Council has a global mandate, so I will look at this in, in a more global or regional context as well. Um, we have no mandate on the internal political aspects of the Libyan fight, and I know some of the questions that were posed as guiding principles to the speakers had a quite a political context, so I'll stay well clear of that. Um, the UN is uh, enough involved uh, in, in the Libyan in domestic situation. They don't need me to uh, tout out new positions. Um, my presentation will have three parts. Uh, first, uh, a short overview of the evolution of ISIL in Libya and the importance of this affiliate for ISIL core. Um, a little bit more in detail what I already hinted at yesterday. Then I will look at the regional effects of ISIL being in Libya and what that meant for the security 
of the neighboring countries, and then I will try to do an assessment of what potential future developments may be happening. So let me start with uh, the evolution of ISIL in Libya. The story for ISIL is not an unambiguous, unmitigated success story in Libya. Uh, first cells of ISIL emerged in Derna at around 2014, where you could identify them as being ISIL, where they were first contacts with the core. When the group attempted to, uh, attempted to take over and managed for a short period of time, control over the city of Derna by aligning itself with various groups. But fairly shortly afterwards, in 2015, the Shura Council of Mujahideen in Derna, itself a coalition of various groups, ousted the group. This was the first example um, uh, that we could see where the classic ISIL takeover strategy didn't, uh, didn't work. Um, we've seen this many times working very well in Syria, but also in Afghanistan where you have essentially a three-step approach. First, um, you do not announce your presence as, as a group as such. You take a long time uh, uh, at times to gather information and intelligence about the power structures in the area, who has what weaknesses, who what could be used against whom. And then, when you declare your emergency, you immediately align yourself with the second strongest group in that area. Uh, and propose to oust the strongest group in the area. Once that is done, your former ally gets a choice, either join or be ousted yourself. Um, that worked very well in, in many areas in Syria, in some areas in Afghanistan, in particular in Helmand and in, in, uh, in Nangaha, but it didn't work in Derna at all. It, it really backlashed. Once they started to try to oust their former ally, they were ousted themselves. Um, following this retreat, um, from Derna, ISIL started to focus on another city, uh, Sirt, which I'll come to in a second. But from the very outset, uh, even during the Derna time, um, there was a strong support of ISIL core for its projects in Libya. Um, for example, in 2014-15, in, in around 500 Libyan returnees, i.e. Libyans who were already with ISIL in, in Syria, were sent back by the core to support its projects there. Um, and it seemed from the very beginning that ISIL took far more care of this affiliate than the rest of all of the affiliates that emerged. Um, we had the impression that there was an attempt to establish a second strong base, maybe even as a retreat. That became particularly clear um, when, we talked, uh, when we looked at uh, the situation then in Sirt. Um, Again, um, after Derna, uh, fairly quickly, ISIL was able to establish uh, control over the city in Sirt. Obviously, it's a strategic location, so it makes sense to concentrate there. There were quite a lot of network structures already in the city. And, of course, with Sirt, you had the opportunity to gather some support from the Gaddafi tribe, um, former tribe of uh, Muhammad al-Gaddafi, uh, which actually then some of the intelligence officers of the Gaddafi area did join ISIL in Sirt. Uh, now, however, the problem was not an internal uh, um, ouster, but that uh, it was basically fairly quickly squeezed by two um, more uh, other militias, the Misrata, of course, militia, and the oil guards, um, both acting formally uh, uh, loyal to the GNA, but th those loyalty uh, was questionable or is questionable even at this time. Um, these two were instrumental in retaking the city. I, when I looked at uh, some of the media reports in preparation for this report, it was quite striking that it was always talking about the government. The government had nothing, no troops there. It was the Misrata militia and the oil guards from the east and the west who squeezed the city. Um, and the government was simply legally, formally in charge of all of this, but we had never the impression there was any kind of operation control that the government exerted on either one of those militias. Um, that recapture of the city were, went fairly smoothly, and then there was declarations that ISIL has been defeated in, 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 uh, in, in Libya, and this is the end of the project, and it's a significant military defeat. What was not really talked about is that there was a surprising low number of ISIL fighters that were killed or captured uh, during the retake of the city, but there was a significant several hundred numbers of ISIL fighters who actually left the city um, during, this, during this phase, um, um, fairly evenly split split between the southwest and the southeast of the country. The southwest, of course, is a traditional AQIM 
uh, rest and recuperation area. There were uh, uh, attempt, uh, there were abilities for those fighters to melt in with already existing Al Qaeda structures. The southeast was the choice because there was an established uh, uh, from the Derna and certain times established foothold of ISIL in the area of Al Kufra. Um, that area was particularly chosen not because it's a particular strategic point militarily, but that's where the uh, human smuggling and uh, human trafficking flows go through and you had to have some kind of structure there to make sure that your foreign fighters that are coming to support you in Libya are, are not going to get uh, kidnapped. So there was an active operation and cooperation with human smuggling operations. One example is a group called Magafe. It's an uh, organized crime uh, group that smuggles and traffics people from the south to the north and so ISIL had a deal with them, payment for security, and uh, a part of the service is foreign fighters get brought to the north without disappearing on the way. Um, since this time, however, uh, since both groups went uh, to the southeast and southwest, um, ISIL has not been able to establish yet, again, uh, territorial control over any significant part of Libya. But um, it maintains a cell structure in all major cities that are capable of, of conducting terror attacks, and I'll get to that in a second. There is a group of fighters that went to the southwest and then onwards to the Sudan-Libyan border and then infiltrated from there Egypt in order to support um, um, ISIL uh, attempts to establish a network on the mainland uh, there in addition to Sinai. Um, uh, one of the questions was about the Tunisian and Algerian members of ISIL in Libya. We did not see them to return home to their countries. Um, the numbers uh, that we have are very small, so we don't have a wave, but a very small triggering number. Although there are a significant number of Tunisians with ISIL in Libya as well as with ISIL in Syria and Iraq. Um, what we've seen during 2017, despite no real attempts to again control territory, is a steady increase of terror attacks by ISIL in Libya. Um, there is um, uh, clearly some connections between ISIL cells in Libya and attacks in Manchester, and some say even attack the, the previous attack in, uh, in Paris. Um, but as far as we can see from the team side, and as far as I can assess, is that it would be an overstatement to say that there is a massive external attack structure of ISIL in Libya. Um, it's it simply, uh, there are more logical connections. The guy uh, you know, had family in Libya. Um, that enabled him to train in Libya rather than train somewhere else. Um, so clearly, um, in 2017 and until now, um, ISIL has not been able to completely recover uh, from its military defeat, but um, it uh, is continuing to try to maintain its network structure. So continuous CT operations in that, in that country are absolutely um, necessary in order to make sure that there is no resurgence because clearly the organization has a great interest to research there. Um, what are the regional effects of ISIL having been or being in Libya? Um, obviously ISIL was able to clearly take care as well as, as Al-Qaeda of the power vacuum created since 2011. Um, um, this is luckily not to the same extent true uh, in the other neighboring countries, um, Tunisia, Algeria, uh, uh, as well as Egypt. However, as demonstrated by the Bardo Museum and the Sus attacks, ISIL in Libya did, of course, specifically train fighters for attacks in neighboring countries. Um, as, as outlined yesterday, um, um, uh, ISIL Corps always saw the affiliate in Libya uh, uh, in a regional context and used Libya, while it was still in control of Syria and in, or during the time that it was in control in Derna, to transfer finances from Syria, Iraq, via Libya to al Maqdis in the Sinai and other groups around the region. Um, I've done that. Um, so what we have for the regional countries is a double returnee problem, right? So returnees from Iraq and Syria, where they have uh, quite good numbers or high numbers, and returnees from Libya. The main challenge that we see is not that there is a massive wave of uh, human beings rolling back into those countries, but that there is even a small trickle of highly trained and highly motivated returnees who combine with the already existing homegrown networks and sympathizers. As you know, there's Anzal Sharia Tunisia that, that uh, has been established on the Al-Qaeda side. There is Jund al-Khalifa in Algeria. 
um, that is still fairly active, that those uh, uh, returnees with the new training, with uh, thoroughly being radicalized, with access to arms and, and money, um, will exacerbate the threat in those countries by simply infusing it with new capabilities and capacities. Um, there is, of course, uh, in particular, a continuing challenge for Egypt, which now is dealing with two ISIL networks, one on the mainland and one on the Sinai, and a quite a significant string of attacks, despite uh, a massive amount of military and police action, both on the peninsula as well as on the mainland. To the south, Libya remains the arms uh, supermarket for the conflict in Mali in the Sahel. Um, and therefore, uh, ISIL's presence in Libya is as much a regional as well as a domestic challenge. Future development. Um, as I said, the uh, uh, southern Libya is and continues to be a rest and re recuperation area for now both ISIL as well as EQIM. Um, while uh, uh, the traditional Al-Qaeda affiliate uh, Ansar al-Sharia, and there were two versions, Derna and Benghazi, um, declared its dissolution uh, 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 last year, um, the, at the same time, AQIM formed a new alliance, combining Ansar Eddin, the one faction of Al-Murabitun, who is still lo uh, loyal to ISIL, the Front de Libération de Massina, uh, into this new uh, uh, alliance called Support for Islam and Muslims. Um, this is not a, a per se a very unusual thing. If you look at AQM in the long run, you see that it's always splintered up and then recombined. Essentially, when Mohtar Bel Mohtar finds he wants to do his own little project, he splinters off and then he recombines with AQM. Um, but for the time being, right now, AQM has consolidated its position right next uh, to Libya in West Africa. Um, and we do see some. Uh, uh, capacity exchange between um, the various groups that make up that new coalition. We don't see a central command structure yet, so it's unclear whether this would be a springboard for AQIM uh, or Al-Qaeda to project itself again in a more organized way into, into Libya. Um, but for the time being, we've seen an, an exchange of uh, knowledge on ID uh, as well as attack tactics between the various groups in the areas of operation. Um, Therefore, um, when we look at, and this is the last question that was posed to me, which brand is more attractive in Libya, I don't think it's a question of attractiveness. It's, it's, it's first of all a question of, in a situation where uh, we still have significant domestic security challenges, uh, where the government uh, has problems projecting out into the, the, the reaches of the country, it's more a question of who, which one of the two organizations, ISIL or Al-Qaeda, is quicker able, both seem to have an interest, is quicker able to establish new network structures in that country. And then from that point onwards, the stronger will be the more attractive simply. Um, Therefore, it's for me really hard to say. Um, obviously, as far as I can see, uh, ISIL seems to have a very, very clear intent to do this. So uh, I would put my money for the time being um, on the ISIL card to say that uh, um, uh, they may be able to do this sooner than Al-Qaeda. As I said, Al-Qaeda needs to reverse, first of all, the dissolution of, of its, its uh, spearhead in, in Libya before it can project back in. Um, However, the best countermeasure that you can uh, think of in the country in order to prevent either one of the brands to become very attractive or any of the other myriad of very small groups that are close to Al-Qaeda or uh, following a similar ideology than ISIL to coalesce into a bigger terrorism problem again is that you establish uh, governance structures in the country that actually are worth, worth being called that. And that's where the challenge continues to lie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schindler. Uh, our last speaker, Dr. Iman Ragab from Egypt. So we are going to the largest Arab state, Egypt, and we are going to the library of radical Islam. Dr. Iman Ragab is a senior research specialized in regional security at Al Ahram Center for Political and Strategy Studies. She is also the acting head of the military and security studies unit at that center. She holds a PhD in international relations from Cairo University. Uh, Dr. Iman, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, I would like, like to thank CAS as well as uh, Sam Ferris for inviting me to be part of this conference. As you notice from uh, the title of my presentation that uh, I prefer to use the words radicalism and terrorism instead of using the other two concepts that has been around yesterday and today morning. Uh, as I believe that uh, uh, to understand uh, the map of terrorism in Egypt and the status of violence that is taking place in Egypt recently, uh, it could be misleading to use the term Islamic radicalism or Islamic jihadists. Because Islamic radicalism is just focusing on the uh, radical groups that are driven by religious or Islamic uh, understanding or a specific understanding of Islamic Sharia. And in Egypt, there are different types and other types of radicalism. It cannot be just be uh, 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 confined to uh, religious radicalism. Also, the word jihadism, in my point of view, is more uh, legitimizing uh, the existence of terrorist organization instead of describing it as it is. Because jihad in Islam has a specific definition, has specific conditions that need to be met just to call any group to be a jihadist. And thus, using these words, especially among academics and scholars, policymakers, make the Muslim communities, even in the Western countries or even the Arab countries, more tolerant toward the violence being perpetuated by terrorist organizations. Because actually, they are not uh, called or labeled correctly. The scholars usually call them jihadists, using the word jihad that has a specific meaning that he emotional in its side and one, and one of its aspects. And for that, we end up with uh, the attractiveness of the discourse of these groups among the Muslim communities everywhere. Thus, I prefer to use the word terrorism, uh, especially that uh, in my PhD, I focused on violent non-state actors, that terrorist organization is one version of them. And I believe that these organizations are usually driven by a specific interest. They are opportunistic and they are pragmatic. Uh, and even if they use religious discourse or if they have a religious identity, even driven from Islam or Christianity or whatever religion, at the end they have an interest to, to be achieved. Thus I find the word terrorism more neutral or objective in a way or another. Uh, you are supposed to speak only 12 minutes. Okay, but uh, the clicker does not work. It is not working. Yes, yeah. so we use this do? one. It does not work as well. Okay. Okay. When it comes to Egypt, uh, um, there are three main groups that are influencing the scene of terrorism and radicalism in Egypt. The first one is uh, Daesh or ISIS. Specifically, that is active in Syria and Iraq, and recently that began, began to be active in uh, uh, eastern Libya. Uh, the second group is Al-Qaeda, and to be more specific, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, the third group is the Muslim Brotherhood, that uh, recently tend to uh, uh, use terrorism and violence as a strategy to uh, achieve their own political goals inside the country. And um, uh, speaking of these three groups, it's very important when uh, analyzing and mapping uh, uh, the terrorist organizations active in Egypt in these uh, days, uh, just to avoid uh, overestimation uh, of ISIS or underestimation of Al-Qaeda or ignorance of uh, terrorism and violence being perpetuated and carried out by the Muslim Brotherhood. This map has been released and published by the Independent, and it shows you the number of, or the amount, the weight of terrorist attacks carried out by uh, ISIS, that is colored in red. And as you see, the, the, the attacks in Egypt are still uh, significant in comparison to other countries in the world. When it comes to Al-Qaeda, uh, many scholars who focused on Egypt used to ignore the importance of Al-Qaeda ideology and Al-Qaeda attractiveness to uh, young people in Egypt. But this picture shows you the, the victims and uh, those who got killed in uh, the attack that took place against uh, Arauda Mosque in northern Sinai, and specifically in Ba'ul Abd. Uh, this attack was one of the uh, triggers that uh, motivated many Egyptians, many young Egyptians to be more uh, uh, recruited by Al-Qaeda uh, uh, affiliated cells, speci specifically those that are active in eastern and uh, the western desert of Egypt, uh, beside uh, Jundal Islam that began, began, uh, began to be active again in northern Sinai and Jundal Islam known to be uh, one of the Al-Qaeda cells. Also, um, 
I'm sharing here with you uh, Abdel Rahim al-Mismari, who he's one of the Libyan foreign fighters who managed to sneak into Egypt uh, since the second half of 2016, and he was taking part in one of the uh, attacks uh, in the Western uh, Desert. And uh, Abdel Rahim al-Mismari also is one of the members of uh, one of the most important Al-Qaeda affiliated organization that began to exist in Western Egypt that's called Ansar al-Islam. Uh, for that, Al-Qaeda uh, future in Egypt needs to be reassessed in terms of these uh, new developments. Also here, I'm sharing with you uh, one of the Congressional Service Research reports about Egypt, and it shows you that uh, Hasma and Lawa al-Thawra, that is considered to be established as well as funded uh, and, uh, uh, by uh, Muslim Brotherhood leaders and members, to be uh, recognized by the U.S. Department of State as terrorist organizations. And uh, again, uh, uh, this is just uh, reflecting another development that Egypt is witnessing when it comes to the active terrorist organizations and cells inside the country. Uh, in that context, uh, it is, uh, it's important for me to uh, um, explain to you that the landscape of terrorist organizations in Egypt is transforming and it is very dynamic. It is not static, even though Egypt has been going through a revolution twice in the first decade of, 2000, of the 21st century. Um, uh, and here I'm sharing with you the most important terrorist organizations that are able and capable and resilient enough to carry out terrorist attacks inside the country, either in northern Sinai or in, in the mainland, and also to uh, uh, have a, a large number of uh, uh, civilians who got killed or injured. The first organization is Wilayat Sinai, or Ansar Beit al-Maqdis, that uh, uh, announced its allegiance to uh, Daesh in 2014, and it is still active, and it managed to merge with around 12 Salafi jihadist uh, groups, as it's called, uh, in northern Sinai since 2011. Thus, it is con considered as the umbrella terrorist organization active in northern Sinai. The second organization is called Daesh Egypt, and this one started to exist in the mainland uh, since the end of 2016, thanks to the foreign fighters coming from Libya, either through Sudan or uh, through the uh, western borders with Libya. And the third group is Lua Thawra and Hasm, that is also active in the mainland, and it, ha it focuses on targeting police officers, uh, the military uh, officers, as well as the infrastructure. We have other small cells that, is our, uh, that existed in one point of time, uh, some of them still active, others decided to merge with other bigger groups. Helwani Brigade is one example that has been dismantled and most of its leader captured by the police. Uh, the execution of Brigade that existed in 2011 and then ceased to exist. Revolutionary punishment and popular resistance were very active in the mainland and they were targeting the infrastructure in the country. Um, they are no longer active. And Saad Islam Al-Qaeda uh, affiliated uh, organization and it's active till now in the eastern or the western side of the country. Jund al-Islam, it is located in northern Sinai, uh, and uh, now it has its own fight with the Ulayat Sinai. Uh, Jund al-Khilafa fi Ard al-Kanana also announced its allegiance to uh, Daesh in 2014, but it is no longer active, and some uh, experts say that they merged with Ulayat Sinai. The last one is Ajnad Masr, uh, and it was also active in northern Sinai, but it is no longer uh, there so, uh, due to uh, uh, different level of resilience among these organizations. Speaking of this, transforming landscape is, uh, uh, is understood uh, when it comes to number of factors. The first one is that uh, uh, the complexity is created by two revolutions or two political changes that Egypt witnessed in 2011 and 2013, created many losers and winners, and also created many grievances, and uh, uh, turned many uh, parts of the territory of Egypt into hotbeds or uh, strongholds uh, that is attracting foreign fighters not only from Libya and uh, Syria and Iraq, but also according to the official statistics and information that has been released by the government, there were a number of Turks and Syrians as well as uh, Palestinians who began to move into northern Sinai in order to practice uh, terrorist acts with different uh, uh, goals to be achieved. Uh, the second factor is the uh, resilience of terrorist organizations. Uh, as I said, that, that, that recently the most resilient groups, Wilayat Sinai, Lua Thawra, and Hasm, and Daesh. 
And speaking of resilience is uh, very important when it comes to analyzing the uh, uh, the strength of terrorist organizations and their future, uh, specifically when it comes to the type of networks they are relying on in order to recruit new fighters, in order to gain logistic support, in order to provide or to get their financial uh, needs. In the case of Ulayat Sinai, for example, they depend a lot on, um, on the tunnels and the uh, uh, logistic networks they have with the uh, militants and Gaza Strip. Uh, when it comes to Ansar al-Islam and other al-Qaeda <coughs> affiliate cells in the eastern and the western part of the country, they depend a lot on Libya as well as Sudan. And these transitional networks uh, considered to be as the center of gravity to many of uh, the terrorist organizations active in Egypt these days. Also, another factor uh, that is contributing to, that, uh, to the transformation of the landscape terrorist organizations active in Egypt is the counter-terrorism policies that is being going, under, uh, is going through developments. The government becomes smarter, let me say in that way, uh, when it comes to analyzing information and intelligence, and they manage to have one step ahead uh, of the terrorist organization. Uh, however, the terrorists are still capable and able to plan and to carry out significant attacks that uh, uh, cause a lot of losses, especially when it comes to humanitarian losses uh, among the civilians. Uh, the other factor is that uh, the fact that Egypt is one of the countries that are affected by the flow uh, of returning tourist fighters from Libya, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, and uh, uh, Abdel Rahim al Mismari, that I shared with you, his uh, image is one example that the government decided to share information with the public about him. But there are estimations that the total number of foreign fighters or foreign tourist fighters who managed to get into uh, the country ranged from 300 to 350. Uh, from fighters, most of them decided to join the terrorist organizations in Northern Sinai. Another point when it comes to mapping uh, the, the status of terrorism in Egypt is the question about religious drivers. Uh, in my point, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, focusing on the religious aspect uh, is to, 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 uh, in the case of Egypt is misleading to a great extent. Egypt is, is one of the cases in the, in the Arab region, and let me say in the Middle East, where political terrorism is intersecting with religious terrorism as well as criminal terrorism. And I'm sharing with you here the slogans and mottos of the mo number or example of three terrorist organizations that uh, uh, active uh, in Egypt, and they are considered to be the most influential terrorist organizations. Uh, Al-Aqab al-Thawi, or the Revolutionary Banishment, it used to be active in the mainlands until the, the beginning of 2017. The motto of that organization reads, it is time to correct the direction of the revolution, January 2011, to get rid of the dictatorial regime that aims to bury the revolution. The only way is to build military capabilities. And this is a political motto rather than a religious one. Um, when it comes to Hasm, uh, that has been recognized by the U.S. as a terrorist organization recently, they are mixing between the political drivers as well as religious discourse. Their motto reads, by our hands we protect our revolution. And again here, they, use, they are using one of the uh, Quranic verses that is focusing on facade. And it says, They consider the, Islam, the regime in Egypt as a corrupted one, that is increasing the level of corruption, and the responsibility of Hasm is to end that corruption. And again here, they are using religious discourse just to as a cover to their political uh, objectives. Uh, the last thing that I want to share with you is another example. Uh, Humat al-Sharia is one of the videos that has been developed and created by uh, Ulayat Sinai. And recently, Ulayat Sinai, they have their own decentralized um, uh, media bureau that create its own uh, videos and its own uh, media uh, 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 message uh, that has a low, very uh, uh, easy to be noticed in Egyptian taste, <laughs> or let me say a localized uh, version of what Daesh is believing in. Humat al-Sharia was focusing mainly on um, on the presidential election that Egypt is having right now, and it had only one specific message, is threatening regular citizens from going to vote in that elections. And even they consider the citizens, if they decided to go to, to vote, to be infidels and unbelievers. Um, 
this this type of videos and these type of messages is just uh, um, uncovering another aspect of the goals and the objectives that Wilayat Sinai in Northern Sinai is aiming to achieve, uh, and how they are using uh, different uh, religious uh, discourse uh, in order to cover the, their main uh, political end. And even Humat al-Sharia, the guardians of Sharia itself, is just another way of how they use and pick up the labels of their videos they are using to recruit or to attract new recruiters. And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raga. Questions? Dr. Lahoud. Thank you. Um, my question to Dr. Iman. Um, the mosque attack last year, to my knowledge, uh, neither the Islamic State nor Al Qaeda has claimed responsibility for that. So, based on what um, we see on social media, um, there have been rumors that maybe the government might have might have carried out the attack. Um, there is a Christian group that has claimed the attack, but I'm just surprised um, if if no if if I am correct that that nobody neither the Islamic State nor Al Qaeda claimed responsibility for it. What do you think is going on? Thank you. Uh, next question. Okay. Yep. One question to Dr. Kendall. You showed the surprising variety of promotional efforts of Al-Qaeda to win over hearts and minds. But to what extent do they exert control over the tribes once they are present in an area, compared, for example, to Daesh in eastern Syria? So let's take another question from here, and then we reply, respond, and then get back to another row of Hi. questions. Hi, my name is Rudain Al Balbaki. I work here at the Isan Faris Institute. Actually, uh, Mr. Christoph just uh, uh, brought up uh, the tribes. First, Dr. Kendall, thank you for talking about the communities that are uh, living, that had to deal and live under, whether it's Al Qaeda or, uh, or Daesh. At the Institute, we work uh, on a project that is funded by Conrad Adenauer, Stiftung uh, Syria and Iraq office, that looks at the intra and inter tribal dynamics in Deir Zor and uh, in Deir Zor in Syria, and their role in uh, facilitating or uh, obstructing the expansionism of uh, of Daesh in Deir Zor. So uh, you've talked about mechanisms going on uh, between Al Qaeda and uh, the social and political existing structures in the specific areas uh, in Yemen. So what are these mechanisms? Can we speak about a legitimacy of the governance of does Al Qaeda? play the grievances of the tribes, or for example, uh, go into coalitions with the tribes. For example, in Deir Zor, we have noticed that uh, Daesh would go into coalitions with tribes who were previously allied to the Syrian regime, so who has lost their control over a lot of resources in the time that uh, the Free Syrian Army or the Jabhat al-Nusra took over Deir Zor. So does it work? Does these mechanisms exist in Yemen too? Thank you. Okay. Gentlemen, yeah. uh, use the mic. Touch upon some of the similar factors, actually. Um, I had, uh, I have some research partners in Yemen, and they are talking about several of the tribes uh, changing in nature. Some of them, like Yafa, are weakening. The Sheikh Kabilas, uh, the expression they are using, are losing power because of the civil war over and over and uh, again. I wonder what that will do with the dynamics in, in the uh, with Al Qaeda. And uh, I also wonder how you see the current uh, disagreements in the South, uh, and if there's any opening among some of the political actors, like parts of the Al Hirak movement and the STC, for closer connections again with Al Qaeda, because Al Qaeda has been used instrumentally in, in, in Yemen several at several locations in the past. Can this happen in the future? So we yeah. have three questions for Dr. Kandal and one question for Dr. Raghav. Dr. Iman, please go ahead about the question regarding the mosque attack in Egypt. Thank you. Um, to be direct, uh, uh, Wilayat Sainé did not uh, announce its responsibility for that attack. However, they released many videos before the attack. One of them is Millet Ibrahim. Um, uh, it shows uh, the position of the group towards the Sufis. 
uh, uh, toward uh, uh, those who are standing against uh, the uh, group understanding of Islam. And even in that video, they uh, uh, beheaded uh, two leaders of the Sufi groups. And uh, mentioning the Sufi groups is important in understanding a Rauda attack because um, uh, the mosque uh, is located in Qariyat Rauda, uh, Rauda village, and it exists in Ba'r al Abd city in northern Sinai. Most of its people are believing in Sufism, and even they have this uh, uh, um, room for ceremonies uh, following the Sufi uh, understanding of Islam. And this mosque was used by, extensively by believers in Sufism to do the Friday uh, ceremonies. Even though the, um, uh, the organization itself did not announce responsibility after the attack, and many scholars say that uh, it is because of negative uh, reaction uh, created by such an attack, uh, uh, looking into the type of message they were creating previous uh, in the time previous the attack, uh, it shows that they don't stood against it at all. Uh, not only because they are Muslims, just anyone may argue that ISIS will not attack a mosque. They may attack a Christian church, but not a mosque. But again, they don't have any issue uh, as long as they are attacking a religious institution that is not following their own uh, doctrine. Uh, another point that needs, or I would like to highlight in responding to that question, is that the details, the details of the attack shows that they were not targeting the mosque as a building, rather they were focusing on increasing the number of civilian deaths. And uh, the, t the total toll reached 305 uh, civilians were killed, including children and uh, uh, elder people. Uh, and this shows that they are moving more towards uh, urban terrorist uh, tactics rather than uh, focusing on attacking the police or the army. Uh, the final point to, uh, uh, to that is um, uh, uh, the tactics of, uh, uh, of Wilayat Sainé um, uh, has been uh, developing uh, along the way. And uh, some uh, uh, of the uh, uh, developments, uh, and uh, especially when it comes to the type of recruits they managed to attract after a road attack and after uh, the attack on uh, Al Arish Airport, while, where the Minister of Defense and Minister of Interior were there in that airport at that time, uh, shows that um, most of the young people, I interviewed some of them, uh, they consider uh, ISIS did not commit or uh, did not announce that it is responsible for the mosque, but they will not be standing against it because they believe that part of the ideology and part of the rhetoric of Ulayat Sainé is not tolerating having different uh, Muslims practicing different uh, um, rituals uh, from what ISIS believe or Ulayat Sainé is believe is the only correct version or correct understanding of Islam. Uh, it is, you know, uh, unclear to what extent they sent their own fighters to commit or to carry out the attack. But again, uh, according to through analyzing their discourse, they don't have anything in their belief that stand against such attacks. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Can I just that means that they wouldn't have lost anything by taking responsibility for it. So if they're not, if if that's sorry, so if that's if that's fine with them, they're not going to lose support. So why wouldn't they claim responsibility if they did it? Sure. So it's. I think because of the negative reaction from the people living in, uh, in Arilda. After the attack, they, uh, they approached many females who lost their fathers, or brothers, or even their husband in the attack, and they told them, well, the government will not provide help for you. We are the one who are providing help. And they managed to require some of them to provide logistic support to their uh, operations in uh, Be'ul Abd. Dr. Kendall. Mm. Yes, thank you for your questions, very good questions. Um, so you asked about the extent of al-Qaeda control over tribes, and you asked about how the, the mechanisms for influencing with tribes, and you asked about weakening tribes and also about the Southern Transition Council. Right, so I'll try to answer those all together with a bit about the South tacked on the end. Um, so yes, of course. 
it's not easy to control Yemeni tribes, and I do not think for one second that al-Qaeda has ever achieved that. It's about reaching uh, an agreement to be allowed to exist. And of course, so in my own interviews, uh, and I, I actually did the tribal mapping of the eastern areas for the British military, so I, I am quite familiar with how all the tribes interact. Um, what what has happened is that once you get one person or a few people from one tribe into Al-Qaeda, it's not like the whole tribe's with them, it's just that they don't like to fight them. Um, but they will throw people out if necessary. Now, the huge increase in drone strikes, the United, by, by the way, CENTCOM has said that it conducted 131 drone and a couple of including a couple of air strikes against terror targets inside Yemen in 2017 that's massive it's about four times what it was in 2016 and it's more than any of Anne's slides Anna's slides yesterday for Pakistan so you can understand that tribes are no longer quite so welcoming um, to terrorists um, and that they don't want to make these kinds of alliances but there are alliances being made over certain criminal activities like smuggling routes. The war has been breeding these. So whilst the Saudi military coalition has imposed a blockade on the west of the country, Al-Qaeda, by controlling the coastline in the east of the country, was able to control um, the import of fuel, of food, and then the way that gets smuggled across the country was done in alliance with a whole variety of tribes. This still continues now. There's, it's not Al-Qaeda who's in charge of the smuggling anymore, but they are still now changing themselves more into a criminal gang, a protection racket for the smuggling routes. Um, and that involves alliances all the way across uh, Al-Mahra, Hadramaut, and Shabwa. Um, Al-Qaeda has been much more careful about p paying blood money, this comes to the mechanisms, to tribes. When it has screwed up and killed tribesmen by mistake, in other, aiming for military, for example, um, it has negotiated settlements with the tribes involved so as not to anger the tribes. So it's not so much that Al-Qaeda controls the tribes, it's almost the other way around. It's that it makes alliances with them in order to be able to exist. The tribes have become far stronger, actually, since the war, because with the breakdown of law and order and the absence of government security, the thing that glues societies together, particularly in the East, is, tri is tribal law. And uh, that fabric is, is actually stronger, but there are some subtle changes in it. And this is where this is where we, and also coalition um, forces from UAE and Saudi, and even, indeed even Oman, have screwed up, because um, they're still paying off the sheikhs. They're still using this kind of patronage method of paying off the sheikhs of the tribes. This, these are not the movers and shakers anymore. They just pocket the money, and that's that. The movers and shakers in the tribes are now more the guys in their 30s who the young people listen to. Don't forget, Yemen has a population where 48% are under the age of 18. You can't buy them off anymore. And it's no longer these old guys who are really controlling them. Uh, one more point to make, just because it's, it's kind of funny. Um, a really good example of how Al-Qaeda integrates with tribes rather than um, Islamic State is uh, if you just look at the reactions to the films that they've produced, the first Al Qaeda, the first Islamic State film in Yemen, which announced its launch, it had 18 guys in matching uniforms performing combat moves to a Nasheed planting Dawlat al Islam flag in the desert. And Al Qaeda, by contrast, lots of its films are poorly produced, quite often involves them sitting around eating fruit, drinking water, or talking heads, or singing songs, singing poetry. And I did conduct a very irresponsible academic experiment where I played these films to groups of tribesmen in the East to gauge their reactions. They really did not like the Islamic State film. It really didn't appeal. Yet, of course, when I played it to military audiences in the UK, they thought this is incredibly worrying, and my goodness, look at these 
this, this phenomenon of Islamic State. It's, it's slick, it's organized. But on the ground, it was completely different. They thought, look at these silly matching uniforms, look at these silly matching sandals. Oh, you'd never tie your scarf like that. If you wanted to protect your, yourself against the desert sand in Yemen, these are foreigners. So, um, yeah, Al Qaeda is good at integrating with tribes, but it never controls. Thank you. We better talk about the Southern Transition Council later. Dr. Schindler, if I may ask, who has a better future in Libya among this jihadist group, ISIL, Al Qaeda, or a new one? Hmm. I think the question. The question really, if you look from a domestic security perspective, is less what brand is more attractive. Um, um, it's more does terrorism have future in the country. And as long as we don't see a significant improvement uh, in the situation domestically in, in Libya, uh, any kind of terrorist branding, um, uh, including Libya being part of the supply chain towards southern conflicts uh, in the Sahel, in Mali, that's not going to change. As I said in my presentation, um, whether we see a stronger Al-Qaeda or a stronger ISIL presence will simply depend on which organization is going to be able to establish a new network with, territory, with a bit of territorial control there first. And since ISIL already has started to build up this network of uh, terrorist uh, uh, cells in all of the cities, I would assume ISIL is in a slightly better position at this point than Al-Qaeda to do that, although neither one of them has a particular strong a uh, 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 position in the country at this point compared to the previous situation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, we have two more people who want to ask <coughs> questions, and we are running out of time. Shortly, okay? Very shortly. <laughs> Professor Asimani, Dr. Ragab. Uh, I'm quite aware that the actual regime is fighting terrorism. But I want to ask you, is there any relation between the Egyptian educational system based on the Sharia and the behavior of a lot of jihadists or terrorists, especially against the Christians in Egypt? Thank you. The gentleman in the back. Marcus Tosman from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. My question is somewhat related. Um, I would like you, um, Dr. Ragab, to elaborate a bit on the government's narrative because you differentiate between the different drivers of terrorism. Um, the measures that I've seen so far are more on the educative level, you know, changing the curricula, trying to control sermons, cracking down on illegal mosques and the likes. Would you be able to elaborate a bit on how the government views the drivers of terrorism versus um, how okay. they portray them, <laughs> like in the official narrative. Both questions Thank are you. somehow related, so short answer <laughs> and we are done. Okay, I'm working on a research project and I think it will be published by April. It is on the drivers of terrorism among young Egyptians uh, and it, w it is based on interviews with a sample of those who uh, uh, practice terrorism uh, either in Egypt or in Syria and Iraq or in Eastern Libya. Thus, I may share it with you. But in short, when it comes to education, uh, uh, according to the findings from the interviews that I did, um, uh, the type of religious education in Egypt um, was not mentioned as such. But uh, there is a gap when it comes to the knowledge of religion. And this gap is uh, uh, used by the different discourse and uh, narratives being developed by terrorist organizations active in Egypt. Uh, especially when it comes to the word uh, of al khilafa the word of uh, tawarit and other concepts and words being used in the discourse of the terrorist organization. So when it comes to the narrative of the government, the government is focusing only on religious terrorism. And thus they are empowering the religious institutions, namely Dar uh, al-Ifta, uh, al-Azhar Institution and the Ministry of Endowment, to uh, refute the religious discourse being disseminated by the terrorist organization in mosques or over the social media. And again, they are you know, just focusing on one part of the picture, 
there is no much effort being done when it comes to the, uh, the political drivers or the social drivers. Um, this is in short, just not thank take you very too much. much time. Please okay. join me to thank our panelists, uh, Mona Alami, she might be on board now and flying to Baghdad, uh, <laughs> Dr. Elizabeth Kandal, Dr. Iman Ragyab, and Dr. Hans Jacob Schindler.